So this morning we're going to be talking about social determinants of health, which is something that um, I guess in the last week we've had three different meetings about. So this couldn't be more timely in terms of helping to um, get us started on a good path as we begin to think about the things that affect people's health that are beyond sort of the normal scope that we think of of medical um, and psychosocial issues. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Lisa Bates, who's a social epidemiologist and assistant professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Population and Family Health at Columbia's Mailman School of Public Health. Before she joined Mailman in 2007, she was a Robert Wood Johnson Health and Society Scholar at Columbia. She received her doctorate in 2005 from Harvard School of Public Health. Her research focuses on how social stratification and processes of social change translate into health outcomes. Her current studies in the United States focus on socioeconomic and cultural dimensions of immigrant adaptation and health. Dr. Bates combines training in social epidemiology with a background in qualitative research and international health, and she's concurrently engaged in research on the changing sociocultural and economic determinants of women's health and well-being in Bangladesh with a focus on women's empowerment. She's currently the co-investigator on two NIH-funded projects in South Asia focused on issues of gender dynamics intimate partner violence, and implications for mental health and child development. Dr. Bates leads several teaching initiatives in social epidemiology at the Melman School and is core faculty affiliate of both the RWJ Health and Society Scholars Program and the School Center for the Study of Social Inequities in Health. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Bates. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for that generous introduction, and I'm really happy to be here with you today. <clears throat> um, okay, so let's dive right in. Uh, I want to review briefly the objectives that I set out to achieve through this talk today, reviewing the relative emphasis on social structure and agency and thinking about individual health risk behaviors, considering alternative approaches to understanding and intervening on health behaviors and other pathways that mediate the social determinants of health, and consider the role, given our location today, of the physician in addressing upstream social determinants of health, behaviors, and outcomes. In terms of an overview of what I'm going to go through, there are really three key points that we'll be walking through. We'll consider health behaviors as a primary pathway mediating social determinants of health, alternative non-behavioral pathways linking social structure and health, in this case, for example, processes of social stress exposure, and then rethinking health behaviors by trying to look even farther upstream. So just to start off with giving you a sense of where I'm coming from and the perspective I bring to this question of this broad rubric of social determinants of health, we can really think of that referring to two different kind of pathways to health production. One is how, what I do, is how social factors influence individuals' health status and longevity. That would be the realm of social epidemiology. We can also think about the political economy of public health, which would focus on how social factors facilitate or impede organized efforts at health promotion. And that's something we'll come back to at the end of this talk. So what is social epidemiology? It's the branch of epi that studies the social distribution and social determinants of health. Krieger gives us a more detailed um, definition uh, focusing on how it's distinguished by insisting on explicitly investigating social determinants of population distributions of health, disease and well-being, rather than treating such determinants as mere background to biomedical phenomena. So a lot of the project of social epidemiologists is to bring to the forefront things that in other contexts and other disciplines we try to get rid of. We try to control for, get out of the way, we don't want to talk about, focus on socioeconomic status, we just don't want to confound it to confound our models of the proximal risk factors that are driving the health outcomes of interest. And social epidemiology is trying to put those into the foreground and really understand those as important determinants of health. Okay, and by in service of a definitional pause here, um, the social gradient in health 
refers to the well-documented, often replicated finding that higher socioeconomic status is associated with better health compared to lower SES at every level along a socioeconomic gradient. And this is when it's measured by education um, often and also even by income or wealth. And what you see here is that this non-binary, very gradated relationship between SES and health is a, is a sort of paramount preoccupation of social epidemiology and specifically trying to understand why and in what ways are social factors like SES important for health above a level of SES beyond uh, acute deprivation or absolute poverty? So what is it about socioeconomic status that confer, he confers health benefits if you're one rung from the top of the um, socioeconomic ladder and why do those people on the, on the ne next to the top rung do better than the people on the rung just below them? Why is it this, this incremental relationship? Okay, now I want to jump into where do health behaviors fit in in all of this. Obviously, health behaviors we know are really important determinants, uh, proximal determinants of an array of health outcomes. So we see that represented here. What social epidemiology or the social determinants of health framework tries to do is embed this relationship within the upstream social context. And here with social structure, we're referring to things like socioeconomic status, um, absolute poverty, but also things like neighborhood deprivation, deprivation at the neighborhood level, racial discrimination, um, residential segregation, income inequality, social isolation, and so forth. But we can also think of ways by which factors at the social level and social structure, reflecting social structure, influence health that don't travel through a behavioral pathway. And here the example I'm going to talk about today is one that is mediated by stress. And furthermore, we can go further upstream to think about the broader structural social and economic practices and policies, both in the public realm and the private realm, that are implicated in influencing all of these processes, including, of course, um, unhealthy behaviors. And it's these three domains in which unhealthy behaviors are embedded or bypassed um, that are the focus of this, of this talk. Okay, so first we'll start off with just sort of what do we know about the role of stru social structure influencing unhealthy behaviors, and how do we think about unhealthy behaviors as a mediator on this pathway when we're trying to understand why these factors are relevant for health. If you start off with leading causes of death in the U.S., these are the usual suspects. When you look at the kind of what's referred to in this article as the actual causes of death, these are the, the very behaviorally based uh, predictors or, or proximal determinants of many of these major causes of death, of course. And that's not a surprise. We also know, and I'm just giving you a few examples for illustration purposes, that there are really important social gradients and social patterning in key health behaviors and risk factors for a range of health outcomes here, including smoking. What you're seeing here on the x-axis is a deprivation score. The people down here are the poorest against the most affluent and in, in intermediate ranges in between. And what you see here is in smoking prevalence in Great Britain over two time periods in 1973 and 2004. And what you'll notice is that there's a graded, graded relationship um, in both time periods, whereby the most affluent have lower smoking than the people who are a little bit less worth, less worth worth less well off than they are, and on up in this case, both in, in the two time periods. You'll notice, of course, that between the two time periods, there's an absolute decrease in the prevalence of smoking, which is, of course, what we would expect, and that that decrease is consistent across all levels of deprivation. But what you also see here, interestingly, is that this the slope of this line across um, socioeconomic status increases over time in that what you're seeing here is disparities in smoking prevalence are actually increasing from, point, the, from 1973 to 2004. And what our empirical evidence suggests and our theories predict is that this increased um, inequality in smoking outcomes is a function of the fact that the most affluent are going to be the first to adopt in, and incorporate new information about the health harms related to smoking, take advantage of op opportunities to to, um, for so smoking cessation as well as to avoid initiation to begin with. And what you often see with our most successful public health interventions that have aggregate health benefit, 
is you can see a widening of disparities emerging in that context of that success story. Here's another example using the um, case of obesity, obviously something that's um, perceived to be very behaviorally mediated by diet, exercise, and so forth. And you're looking at young boys and girls by, stratified by racial ethnic group, and you can see that this group is the um, more well-off, they're highest above the poverty line compared to intermediate and the worst off socioeconomically, and you see this increase in uh, obesity. It's not consistent across every racial ethnic group, but it is evident overall, and it is evident um, consistently for several of the groups. What these patterns, the social patterning produces, and more insights, again, to use the case of obesity, what it produces is diagrams like this, which, which produce a bunch of uh, predictive factors that would be influencing the, inter the immediate determinants of obesity that have to do with, um, with health behaviors. And this has become quite now common as a way of thinking about the determinants of, of obesity. And in fact, we have now considerable accumulated evidence and consensus that, first of all, to understand mechanisms underlying social gradients or disparities in health, including racial ethnic disparities in health, we need to account for health behaviors. So if you're a social epidemiologist, this is your project, and you need to account for the fact that probably health behaviors are on your causal pathway between some upstream social factor and a health outcome. We also have a lot of evidence and consensus that if you're focused on changing health behaviors or understanding health behaviors, that you need to do so with attention to the social context and the upstream social factors that drive those behaviors in the first place. One obvious example, continuing with the illustration, the case of obesity, is evidence on the built and social environment and obesity, and also further evidence that obesogenic environments are socially patterned, that they're socially patterned by, um, as a function of racial, ethnic, um, residential segregation, and also as a function of um, socioeconomic differences. And as a result, you start to see all of these models of multi multiple levels of causation for health outcomes, and, and health behaviors are embedded within contexts. Here, this is from the Commission on the Social Determinants of Health. Again, health behaviors understood in the context of uh, upstream social factors. Um, and here, this is where they would be implicated as well. Here you're seeing the multiple kinds, of, uh, in, uh, multiple kinds of social and economic environments that might be relevant for understanding, again, the case of obesity. What I want to do now is just draw on insights about etiology, causation, and intervention from Jeffrey Rose in ways that I think are very helpful for giving us a framework for thinking about the importance of understanding social context when we try to to, to understand the etiology of health behaviors and then intervene upon them. So here's what we, what we get from Jeffrey Rose. His population perspective gives us two insights about the causes of poor health. One is that if you take an individual approach, you're asking why do some individuals have poor health, for example, hypertension, and others don't. If you take more of a population perspective, you're asking why some populations have higher rates of poor health, for example, hypertension, um, rather than other populations. And they're two related but very distinct questions, and they have very different implications. They also have different answers. Here's an illustration um, from Rose comparing Kenyan nomads and British civil servants, populations we often um, juxtapose. And you can see that when you're looking at systolic BP here, you have not only a higher prevalence um, among London civil servants than among the Kenyan nomads, you also see that the distribution curves are entirely different. So even though these are obviously distinct, the distributions overlap, but they're quite different. And in order to understand that difference, we might start asking questions about at the population level. We could figure out within this population, what are the determinants of individuals being on this end versus down here? We could ask the same question for this population, but it wouldn't give us any insight as to why the distribution for this population looks like this and the distribution for this is so much lower overall. And that, for that, we need to ask different questions. So to find the determinants of incidence and prevalence rates, we have to study the characteristics of populations, not individuals. Homelessness is another example. If you wanted to understand the determinants of who becomes homeless, you would be focusing things like, on things like mental illness, substance abuse, and so forth. 
If you wanted to understand the rate or prevalence of homelessness in a community, you'd need to start looking elsewhere. If you focus on individuals, you're getting an insight into who gets slotted into those homeless positions. But it's not telling you anything about why you have a prevalence of homelessness in one community that is different from another. To get insights about that, you need to look at things like the availability of affordable housing in one community versus another, no matter what's driving it, whether it's economic factors, social policy, and so forth. And so you really need to start focusing on different kinds of determinants to understand population level effects. The other insight that we get from Rose's population viewpoint or perspective is that the factors that explain differences between individuals within a population may not be useful from an explanatory framework when we try to understand differences between populations. One, this insight gives us information about what um, emerges from this is the problem of what's referred to as a ubiquitous exposure. So if, let's talk about obesity again. If we wanted to understand causes of obesity in, in the US, we need to, for example, take into account portion size in the US. Individ Inter-individual variability within the US context is not going to give you insight about portion size because portion size in the US relative to portion size in other context is ubiquitous. We're all exposed to it. But with variation in terms of the individual uptake of portion size, large portion sizes, but it's part of a, a sort of feature of US culture and society that is relatively ubiquitous, and we won't be able to pick that up as a determinant if we only focus on inter-individual differences within our society. It just simply won't show up because the more widespread a cause, the less it explains the distribution of individual cases. But if we're trying to understand why is obesity in the US what it is compared to other countries, we might start need to start looking at these population level explanatory factors using cross context, cross population comparison. Now, Rose's insights also apply to prevention. He suggests two approaches to prevention that correspond to these etiologic approaches. The individual one is a high risk strategy and the population approach yields a population level strategy. The high risk prevention strategy, something familiar um, to all of us, you screen a population to identify their, whether they cross a threshold of risk for a particular risk factor and then we provide an intervention and then we hope that this moves people from this end of the risk curve farther down and we have ameliorated. Oh, okay. It's not showing up? Just for people watching. Okay, okay, great. Um, all right. Okay, and in contrast, the population prevention strategy asks us to do something else. First of all, it recognizes that even though people at the high end of the risk distribution have a greater relative risk of the outcome, the truth is that a large number of cases um, of people at a small risk give rise to more cases of the outcome um, than the small number who are at high risk. An example of this um, is, of course, Down syndrome. More women give birth under the age of 35 than women who give birth over the age of 35, but the relative risk above that age threshold is much greater. We still have more absolute levels of Down syndrome coming from women who give birth below that age threshold. The task here is to shift the entire population distribution rather than targeting high-risk individuals. So it looks like this. Here we're asking for interventions that move everybody, not just the people at the tail end of the distribution, above that risk threshold. So here we have some, some comparative advantages and disadvantages of each strategy, and I want to focus on the advantages of the population strategy. High risk, obviously, you get to tailor your intervention to the individual. It's cost effective if you have limited resources, and if there's any risk involved in your intervention, it's going to be borne by the people who stand to benefit from it most, rather than the general population, which includes people who won't benefit from it personally. The population strategy is more radical. It's trying to get at underlying root causes, and it reduces, importantly, reliance on individual agency. It, it takes the distribution um, in its entirety in a different direction, and it doesn't rely on individuals making individual level changes or different choices. So an example that's really kind of facile, but it, it's helpful for illustration purposes, is the difference between admonishing people to use fluoride toothpaste and putting fluoride in the water. With the latter strategy, you're not dependent on individual agency to make different choices and engage in that particular health behavior. You're also changing the broader normative context. So in, in individual differences are not deviant. They require less 
a kind of abnormal behavior against the grain because the entire normative context is shifting. And therefore, you have significant potential for population health overall. There are some relative disadvantages that kind of mirror these advantages. Um, in the population strategy, again, you have small benefit to each individual, but the absolute benefit to the population is large. And if you have risks involved, there can be a problematic benefit to risk ratio. My focus here with Rose is on the, the advantages of the population approach, which get us thinking about how to move those risk distributions by moving them in their entirety rather than singling out a high-risk population and asking them to behave in some way that is different from the norm. We need to start fo focusing on norms at the community level, the population level, um, and these ubiquitous exposures rather than these inter-individual differences. Okay. I want to move on now to the alternative um, pathway that I mentioned, which in this case I'll focus on as stress. So that's here. Okay, so here we're bypassing unhealthy behaviors, sort of. So I mentioned social gradients in health. Early and very critical evidence about the existence of social gradients in health and the nature of them came from the Whitehall study of British civil servants starting way back in the 60s by Sir Michael Marmot and colleagues. And what they've done is taken a body of people who are in the British civil servants and enroll them in a longitudinal study. The benefits of the study are significant and they include the fact that this is a relatively homogenous population. They all have access to health care. They're all white collar workers. You're looking at occupational differences within the British civil service, but not differences that span sort of white collar workers and coal miners. You have a homogeneity imposed by that restriction that allows you to do what they've done, which is isolate social class differences by education within this population of all working um, white collar individuals. And what they've found is that these, they've uh, they identified across occupational categories that are very, you're, you're able to stratify this population. It's very class conscious. It's very easy to, to stratify this population by class uh, according to their occupational status. And what they found is that there were large differences in health, health outcomes, disease outcomes, and also in mortality, despite accounting for key risk factors. Here's an illustration of those findings. Here you're looking at four of the administrative categories. The administrative group is the highest status group, followed by professionals and executives, then clerical and other. And here you're looking at all-cause mortality over, over follow-up. And what you can see is there's this graded relationship where each level does better than the one preceded it. Now again, remember, everybody here is employed. Nobody's in poverty. Everybody's in a white-collar job. And you see this really stark difference even after you account for a lot of the major risk factors you would expect. Here that's illustrated by this graphic showing again the four, same four categories. This time, what you have here are the extent to which these differences can be accounted for by these risk factors. And you'll notice here that the largest group is that which is unexplained. This is how social epidemiologists kind of backed into a lot of work on stress and stress processes that may be related to health outcomes by focusing on this so-called residual effect. This is the part of the graded relationship due to occupational status that couldn't be explained away by the obvious risk factors, blood pressure, smoking, obesity behaviors, et cetera. And that was persistent and couldn't be attributed to these known risk factors. And this generated a lot of interest about social status, social hierarchies, and how differences in social status, even within this relatively homogenous population, could generate important, uh, persistent and large gradations in survival. Another way that we sort of back into the suggestion that there's something else going on here to explain these social differences in health is from the recent IOM report showing the dismal status of US health compared to peer countries. You can see we come in way down here um, and all cause mortality. And that in, I encourage you to read this if you haven't. What some of the most compelling uh, pieces of evidence on which this report is based show how poor the status of, of um, Americans is relative to peer countries, even after you account for socioeconomic differences and racial composition and finding that the people who are 
uh, really well off economically in the US are, have worse health than people, for example, in the UK who are less well off socioeconomically. So we're really not doing too well. And the, the report looks for the obvious usual suspects, right? Is it healthcare? They conclude, um, just to, in a nutshell here, even if healthcare plays some role, decades of re research have documented that health is determined by far more than healthcare. And of course, they ask, well, how much of this is driven by the bad health habits of Americans relative to other countries? And they conclude, based on the preponderance of evidence, that, the, uh, that they need to look beyond individual behaviors and choices to systemic processes that may influence multiple health outcomes. It means looking at social policies and also means looking at the effects of social systems in the US that don't really operate through the sort of usual suspects of health behaviors. And that um, is how we sort of get to the question of stress and how stress may mediate social group differences in health. They can by reflecting two processes, differential exposure. People at lower socioeconomic status or with any kind of social disadvantage are at increased likelihood of experiencing stressful life events. This can be job loss, divorce, uh, death, premature death of a loved one, etc. They're also at greater risk for experiencing the presence of chronic stre stressors, job insecurity, relational discord, caring for unhealthy relatives, and so forth. There also may be, we, as we understand it, differential vulnerability and reactivity to the exposures to stressors. Lower SES disadvantaged populations have fewer coping resources and may resort to more maladaptive coping styles and responses to the exposure to stressors. And this is where actually behaviors start to creep back into the story a little bit in terms of how people respond to stress. So we know, of course, um, that when we observe stress processes in humans, we have a cascade of variable neuroendocrine and immune system processes. We've documented this extensively in experimental and observational studies through um, manipulation and experimental conditions, um, and elsewhere looking at the stress markers of populations engaged in or exposed to what are recognized as universal stressors, um, caregiving roles being one of them. And there's also a lot of work coming out of life course epidemiology suggesting the extent to which differential reactivity may be a function of kind of early, early life, even in utero, exposures which may produce a kind of programming over the life course that, that creates differential reactivity. Here's a classic example of a study on stress and immune response. Here, Sheldon Cohen and colleagues um, did this study where they, they experimentally exposed individuals who were all healthy at baseline to five different kinds of viruses and variants. And then they, they tested, they, they gave them a, a known stressor exposure that will, like a public speaking task or a math calculation task. And then they observed, they followed them in isolation to see who then subsequently developed symptomatic um, outcomes. And they observed that those with higher um, psychological stress scores at baseline were much more likely to show infection compared to those with lower psychological stress um, over time, suggesting that stress may be involved in multiple kinds of vulnerability and a generalized susceptibility to exposures to stressors and even of the infectious nature. When the, within the broad rubric of social determinants of health via stress, we also have now quite a body of literature showing a multitude of pathways by which stress-related processes can play out and influence health outcomes. Things like acceler accelerated aging, um, closely related to that, shortened telomere length is a function of exposures to chronic, chronic stressors. Um, uh, animal models showing epigenetic processes and stress reactivity. Allostatic load has been uh, a sort of a construct that's now widely used, often criticized, but basically captures an array of HPA access and immune function stress responses and refers to the sort of overburdening of the system as a result of inability to reestablish some sort of homeostatic state, but as a function of this pr repeated exposures to stressors or prolonged exposures to chronic stress. And now also increasingly we have from more of a, a psych neuro um, realm, we have evidence of early life stress and SES deprivation, poverty and so forth in childhood as being implicated in neurological changes in development, whether it's um, emotion regulation, cognitive function and so forth, 
that may also be important parts of the pathways to um, ultimate health outcomes that may help us understand some of the social patterning and health that we observe. What you wind up then with is something like this, recognizing how social structure patterns the um, likelihood of exposure to things like racial discrimination, poverty, social isolation, thereby producing um, an exposure to stress, and the effects of stress then on health outcomes mediated by immune function or susceptibility, stress hormones, et cetera. But also recognizing that the reactivity is matters here at multiple stages. So how people have, what kind of resources they have to cope with a job loss or with a divorce or with the death of a loved one, et cetera, experiences of discrimination and how that influences this subsequent um, pathway as well as reactivity and responses at this stage where um, mediate or modifying perhaps the extent to which a stress exposure, a stress response, that actually translates into a health outcome. And again, in all of this reactivity and coping, we again have behaviors back in the picture. And there are a lot of studies showing, of course, that uh, behavioral self-medication um, through health behavior engagement may be an important Folk may be an important so source of uh, behavioral coping for exposures to stress and dealing with stress experiences. Okay, and finally, I want to um, go a little bit farther upstream and think about how to put health behaviors in an even broader context. So here we're getting up into, into this domain here. And for that, I want to draw on a recent book by Nicholas Freudenberg, who's here in the city, called Lethal But Legal, Corporations, Consumption, and Protecting Public Health. And this is what he does in this book. He focuses on the policies and practices of six industries, alcohol, automobiles, firearms, food and beverage, pharmaceuticals, and tobacco. And he uh, describes what he refers to as a, in a very sort of provocative way, quite intentionally, I'm sure, as the corporate consumption complex. And here really focusing on the primacy, um, no surprise, of profit generation and the limits of government regulatory oversight and restriction due to political influence, um, also uh, financial influence of corporations on public policy. What's interesting about this book is it talks about how uh, the current epidemic, right now we have a so-called epidemic globally, of non-communicable diseases, right? And what he's showing us is that compared to other eras or types of epidemics, um, infectious and, and so forth, we have created, this is the sort of the one of our own making, and this is the one where we really kind of do know what causes these things, and there's not a mystery so much. It's just that we really don't have the means to go about tackling um, the problems that are, the, the forces that are generating this so-called epidemic. And I think that what his analysis points out is that even referring to an epidemic of non-communicable diseases um, gives us an, an implied analogy to infectious diseases, which is a little bit erroneous, because um, it kind of has this connotation of there's a plague coming upon us rather than one of our own making. Um, and this masking, I think, of the true etiology of outcomes like obesity um, and related morbidity and premature mortality also gets just even worsened further by a lot of um, uh, recasting them, which is now in vogue in much of the literature as communicable, right? As this, the communicable spread of things like obesity and so forth. And again, it suggests with this connotation of an infectious process that this is something that, that emerges exogenously onto society rather than one that is, is a function of our own systems. And what he argues by focusing on these policies and practices, and it's kind of the obvious suspects about marketing tactics and the increasing targeting and sophistication of those practices, also lobbying and influence on government policy, of course, both in the US and internationally in terms of trade agreements, um, and quite aggressively and with quite a degree of sophistication. But what I also appreciate about his analysis is the extent to which he highlights that this complex uses its political quote, this is a clout, this is a quote from his book, when it needs to, but much of its impact is due to its success in promulgating and broadcasting an ideology that supports its values and justifies its actions even when they have been shown to cause millions of preventable deaths. In other words, 
the corporate consumption complex is propped up by reliance on an ability to refer to the tropes of individual choice and responsibility and personal liberty. And in effect, what he's arguing is that, yes, behind the scenes, there's a lot of money going on, a lot of influence uh, to affect policies and to push back against restrictions and limits on, on their practices. But also, it's incredibly successful in propagating and sustaining this ideology about health behaviors or about individual choices. And those individual choices are important American rights. These are liberties that really need to be protected. I'm going to walk through an illustration of this. My note here refers to a little bit of navel gazing in my discipline about the insights from his book, um, which reflect the fact that I feel like in social epidemiology, there's a little bit of ambivalence about talking about health behaviors. Um, we actually sort of, I think, sometimes seek to deflect attention from the, the behavioral pathway because we kind of have internalized the notion to some extent that they implicate personal responsibility and therefore risk victim blaming. Um, or at least we think that that interpretation is inevitable. So the story then becomes poor people have bad habits or racial minorities have poor cultures that produce bad health habits. And we don't want to be implicated in that narrative. We talk about uh, the structural barriers to behavior change, but in doing so, the locus is still individual change and not like corporate change, as he's suggesting. And what Freudenberg does is he pivots our attention to the supply side rather than the demand side of unhealthy consumption. And that's sort of so simple and yet so radical in the way he explicates this. So I kind of feel like it's, it's, it's pointing back and saying, no, we should be talking about health behaviors because they really, really matter. They're really important for um, understanding why, so, why social <laughs> factors influence health. But then we should direct our attention to the appropriate um, level of intervention. So here's an example I wanted to walk through that I think nicely illustrates his argument. We probably all remember the failed big soda ban attempt of 2013 and 14 which generated a lot of derision, of course, um, directed at Bloomberg and the idea of the nanny state, uh, a lot of mockery. Even, even my, 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 my John Stewart, who's my hero in terms of penetrating hegemonic discourse, right, was right in lockstep making fun of Bloomberg for his big soda ban attempt. Um, so a lot of derision and then a lot of, uh, uh, of backlash, right? We had the uprising of consumer freedom, a lot of um, commercials about, you know, and, and ads and so forth about this is a slippery slope and you're never, you know, what's next? You won't be able to eat anything you want and so forth. But we, um, yeah, I'm sure you've seen these. They're still on trucks around the city. But the question we have to ask is this, how much is this truly a spontaneous grassroots consumer backlash to encroachment on personal liberty or a very calculated, well-funded, industry-led campaign to protect market shares? Um, and in fact, the evidence suggests the latter. Um, these are reports that came out in this process of, um, uh, of the, the industry putting millions of dollars into uh, gra so-called grassroots uh, campaigning to, against the soda ban. Um, this is a similar effort in New Jersey to impose a, a very, very tiny tax on sodas. Um, and as this quote in the Times says, the beverage industry has outspent the pro-tax side and has succeeded in painting the soda tax as a naked money grab cleverly disguised as a health policy. And that failed. This is from a, um, a very recent, just, just this year, recently published series of papers in The Lancet. It's the second of a series of six papers focusing on obesity. And what's interesting is this diagram kind of talks about policy that the, the title of this article is Smart Food Policies for Obesity Prevention. And it talks about policies and it talks about um, at, at multiple levels in the food environment, social environment, but it's, it's very much about how we can help people make healthier, um, develop healthier preferences and, it's, um, and, and, and overcome barriers to the expression of those healthier preferences. <laughs> the entire article is a little bit more, um, I think, nuanced and it does take into account the fact, uh, the need for attention to the so-called supply side, um, the pushers of these products rather than the users. Um, but it's subtle, and it's not as, as uh, explicit here as 
um, as the attention to we still need to change consumers and their preferences. And what, again, Freudenberg's book shows is, is just undermines the whole entire argument about the extent of that free preferences, that free choice that's really being exercised when, um, and, and the amount of money that is being invested and science that is being invested in manipulating those choices that are really not the, the function of, of autonomous choice, but, but rather something quite different. Okay, I said I would say something about physicians' roles in attending to social determinants. I think that there's an important role of clinicians in clinical encounters with patients that has to do with, um, quite simply but quite powerfully, about acknowledging and interrogating and monitoring the kind of social factors and stressors that affect patients' lives. I, um, I think data collection, uh, routine monitoring of these things is really important, but it's also part of the more subtle clinical encounter. I think a lot of research recently is suggesting the importance of balance in proportion, but with variation, of messages about individual responsibility and agency around health behaviors and recognition of social structure. So recent studies have suggested that policy messages to the general public need to not lose that individual responsibility component or they generate pushback because there's resistance to the idea of social factors without any acknowledgement of individual agency. Individuals, however, seem to really need and benefit from a recognition of social factors that are impinging on their lives rather than feeling like they're potentially being blamed for their circumstances by a focus on their, um, the, the kind of individual autonomy that they actually don't feel like they have. I also think there's a role for physicians in policy encounters. Um, more specifically, leveraging medical credibility to demand accountability for social and economic policies that damage health. One example is a, um, an AMA statement fairly recently that was focused on uh, protesting the exclusion of alcohol and tobacco from the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Agreement, which is a multi-country um, Pacific Rim uh, trade agreement that's been underway for quite some time, largely in secrecy. But um, leaked documents have shown the extent to which trade, free trade, is being privileged over uh, um, national countries' abilities to restrict uh, and put restrictions on things like alcohol and tobacco that are more, much more consistent with uh, the framework convention on tobacco, the UN-led um, convention, and that we're seeing potentially the erosion of uh, the autonomy of governments to be able to um, enact and retain uh, public health provisions um, in the interest of promoting um, a free trade. And so as the AMA, more than public health community, has been at the forefront of arguing that this is really critically damaging and that there needs to be more transparency and discussion of these issues before they go forward. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was... Um Great, and um, I think your you know your comments about about um, the larger political context of this are really poignant. Um, so I had a, I had a couple of comments. Um, one is what's interesting about the the epidemiologic approach is it also assumes there's a magic bullet, and and that's sort of the danger of sort of thinking that in fact there is one solution, much like a an antibiotic or some kind of um, you know, public health sanitary intervention around some of these issues. But we're, so we're faced with a challenge in that population health is now something that we're expected to do more with data. Mm. We have no clue how to handle that because the skills that we have are really still based on an individual encounter, but we're now given the responsibility of taking care of populations. So I'm just wondering if, you have any thoughts about, especially in a training environment, what are the skills that are necessary um, to really uh, address some of these things? Some of the things that we found, for example, are group visits mm -hmm. are very helpful for people to share experiences, to help them know that it's not really their household necessarily um, or, their, um, or their families that are responsible for, but it's, you know, these are shared neighborhood issues or, 
So we need to rethink what we do both as clinicians but also as educators on mm -hmm. teaching people to get to where they need to be when in fact, um, if we're going to make a difference, we have to practice medicine differently. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on sort of what you think that, um, aside from having people like yourself on the faculty and basically reminding us on a daily basis that, you know, hypertension and depression are really social diseases? Um, and forgive me for going on, but the, in my own career, for example, People who do family systems work point out that diabetes or anorexia are family diseases, that they're relationship diseases. And when you begin to understand that, then you know that you know, you're not really treating individuals. So I'm just wondering if there are thoughts on how we can really both practice medicine differently and teach our residents differently around uh, making a difference in these issues. Um, it's a really good question, and it's a really hard one to answer, especially as a non-clinician. I think it's a daunting task, and I think it's um, it's a it's a it's an ominous un enterprise that you're um, engaged in because it's your task is to treat the individual, and that's really important, obviously, and to um, pass the mantle of a sort of prevention at a community level, at a population level, is really um, difficult. I think. Because they're, they're, they're not often, they're, they're not, they, they, they connect, but they don't. And I think that some of the things you're describing, though, about recognizing just simply the embeddedness of health and the health processes that produce these outcomes and the social processes is a really, really critical um, component of this. And I would even suggest going farther, I mean, but again, sort of, I suggest it naively as if there are unlimited resources that you have as clinicians to go into the community and mobilize local agents in the communities um, to develop so support systems and advocacy systems um, that, uh, you know, but I, I, do if, I do think that those kinds of coalitions for community, community mobilization are really important. I think the downside with some of those is we often in public health and elsewhere start falling back on the, the default of community strengthening. And <clears throat> the truth is that communities are really, really stretched. And so you're, you're I, 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 pushing that onto communities with the locus of responsibility for this kind of change is, again, almost a sort of form of victim blaming. Um, but I do think that uh, you know, one of the things that saddened me so much during the soda ban debate was, where was the community mobilization to push back on big soda? And where, where was that kind of righteous anger about, you know, and, and we didn't mobilize. We didn't have any counter mobilization in public health along those lines. Um, but I think that, that that kind of collective efficacy that's generated through those processes and also um, can have near and long term benefits. But I think the, the family and community presence piece is, in terms of at the individual level, is really, really critical. And then get your training, get them to be advocates. <laughs> Train them to be advocates. So I wanted to share a quick story um, that illustrates one of your points. But I think the most profound thing that I'm taking away from this is um, we are always scared at a policy level to talk about individual behavior. I think you hit it right on the nose. You know, we're always terrified of that. We always try to find, you know, those ways of couching mm -hmm. this stuff so that people don't feel like they're to blame yet you know uh, as red just said you know we're we're faced with dealing with people one on one a lot and i think the more we learn about that sort of top level stuff that you were talking about so that we can really explain to people that they're being victimized in some way mm -hmm. i think that that's something that people rise up against is the the sense that there's a larger system that sort of that, that are making them the victims and that and that they're really that's an important um, an important finding the the thing I wanted to share with you is when we um, we had a campaign that we led a number of years ago with folks from the Montefiore Ch Ch child health program um, on on changing the school health policy for low fat milk and it was an absolutely astounding event to go to you know, to be in a room with people in like PTA meetings and P they and the American Dairy Association would fly people in in suits to these meetings and they would sit there and they, f they couldn't really find a hook to sort of argue against why there shouldn't be low fat milk. And what they finally did was they developed a campaign that 
said that kids were going to, that we were going to, there would be a resurgence of rickets because kids wouldn't drink milk because it tasted hor low fat milk tasted horrible and that it was better for them to drink whole milk because they would drink it. And in fact, the consumption of milk did go down with the low fat milk and the dairy association um, basically started to produce low fat flavored milk that was sugared so that they, would, they, they loaded the schools up with chocolate milk and strawberry milk and other things that were low fat to meet the requirement, but then ended up putting sh all these sugared sort of milk beverages back, so that, um, which was even worse. And um, that, you know that the power and the amount of money that they contributed to this effort in one sort of school district was just absolutely mind boggling because they saw that as kind of the entry point to policy change all through New York, which ended up happening. And so that had to be followed with another plan to sort of get flavored milk out of the schools. And you know, there's just no end to the amount. The, the, the bottom line is that the minute that, that um, community stopped fighting for that, that things move back in the other direction. Mm -hmm. So it's really not just a one-time sort of campaign on the community's right. part. It's just that you know, they're there forever. Right. But these community efforts are, are, um, are hard to sustain. Right. And as your first point illustrated, we learn, we, we can take lessons from the tobacco story. Hey, demonizing these corporate overlords who are, you know, with twirling mustaches behind smoky rooms and, you know, conniving um, how to manipulate people to become addicts was good PR for a while, right? It sort of engendered a lot of anger and resistance. So we, we can draw on that, ex on that example. But so, guess who else is drawing on that example? It's like big you know, food and beverage. They're learning the same lessons and they're watching the same thing. And that's why in one little locality, right, they will be on it because they don't want the tide to turn. They don't want to set any precedent. They want to squash it. And you're right, the resources are unlimited because the stakes are perceived to be that large. Yeah. Uh, thank you. It was a terrific lecture. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say one thing. I mean, everybody's looking for boogeyman. It doesn't exist. And the power to make the changes that you're talking about resides within all the people in this room. And that is nutrition. The underlying cause of all the diseases that you're talking about, all of them, is nutrition. Okay? Milk is the main cause of diabetes and cancer worldwide. So even talking about switching from high fat milk to low fat milk is relatively ridiculous. Now, um, everybody here who's a family physician, if, if people address the concerns of nutrition, then we could get rid of all these problems. And instead of worrying about, you know, you know all these big companies that are pushing, you know, large amounts of uh, of, of milk on, well, if the doctor tells the family, the family doctor tells the family to stop drinking milk, they will stop drinking milk. I don't know. If, I don't know that that, I don't know that that bears out in, I, I mean, I, I feel like um, the evidence suggests that the individual level behavior change is, and we've learned this lesson, we're still not fully to, coming to terms with this lesson, I feel like, in, in public health, which is that you know, a lot of decades of research and effort around individual level behavior change through health messages, through health education, is just not effective. Health messages and health education don't do anything. But if the family doctors at the grassroots level began to explain to patients about the importance of nutrition, that would work. You cannot have, you know, a big campaign, a big marketing campaign, and try to tell people to eat smaller sodas. You know, I've had a lifetime now of telling these things to patients, and I can tell you that it makes a gigantic impact. Now, how open are people to, these, to this sort of a message? Well, even, even family doctors here are not all that open to mm. it, you know? Mm -hmm. But that's where the answer lies. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, 
So I, w I guess at the end of your talk, um, when you were talking about Freudenberg's book and kind of this idea of how um, big corporations like market to individuals and kind of reframe the debate on individual behavior, um, I guess I was just wondering, like, kind of towards the beginning of your talk, um, you talked a little bit about, like, understanding individual behaviors and and for example like in smoking cessation how like more affluent people are more likely to adopt um, like health promoting behaviors and then and then also when you were talking about stress about how like uh, poor people have like more maladaptive responses to stress and I was wondering like either within your work or the field of social epidemiology how you might be like reframing those ideas of of like in of what seems like kind of behavioral explanations, understanding how like these choices are really conditioned by the way that like populations are differentially advertised to or controlled by um, uh, different social forces. Yeah, that's, um, you know, you, you got to the, you cut to the chase there at the end. I mean, that is very much sort of the enterprise of of um, social epidemiology, and I think this sort of modern inc incarnation of social epi as a subdiscipline of epi really came about in sort of the late 80s and 90s after a period, uh, it's not probably an accident, of real kind of conservatism and a lot of um, cultural notions and a lot of uh, ideas around HIV AIDS in public health and out of individual responsibility. And it was all about individual choices and lifestyles and behaviors. and Social epidemiology was really trying to push back on that and say, wait a second, how much are these choices really just that? And how much are they conditioned by the structural conditions that people face, which are socially patterned? And so all of the kinds of um, the access to more healthy resources or ways of coping, these are all patterned by social factors, by socioeconomic status, by race and ethnicity as a function of, of social differences. Uh, not biological differences. And so um, how do we try to understand the, the drivers of um, or the determinants of the determinants? In other words, why some people engage in health behaviors differentially than others as a result of their social conditions. And you mentioned also the, the, the specific nature of the targeting story. Um, not only is there differential sort of susceptibility to, um, to, to these products, sort of smoking, alcohol, bad food. But the, the targeting of smoking, of alcohol, targeting of alcohol outlets and ads all around the city, you can see it geographically patterned in New York City that is very much corresponds to the demographic and economic patterning in, in the city. So it's not just simply that everybody is exposed to the same availability and people make different choices. Maybe some people have more willpower or less. It's like the, the assault of these products is very, very patterned by social factors through very, very deliberate marketing on, the, on, the, on behalf of, of corporations. Hi, I came very late, unfortunately, and missed most of it. But my question is in terms of um, injustice and corruption and the trauma that it causes, and has that become, is that part of your paradigm, and have you spoken to that? So that, the things of which you speak, I think, would fit very appropriately into what I described as a sort of not behavioral pathway, but a pathway that goes directly from uh, features of the social structure that have to do with social injustices and inequality to health outcomes. And, um, and we see, you know, we, there's a huge body of evidence, and particularly that emphasizes inequality along the axis of race, which is focused not, I mean, sort of this broad category of racial disparities in health, but really the focus is on racism in health and how we understand inequality and injustice along racial ethnic lines is being very, very important to determining the observed racial disparities in health. And those pathways, yes, they're, they're resource pathways, right? Structural discrimination works to influence health through differential access to um, poor neighborhoods, to high quality neighborhoods, to schooling, um, to good food outlets. But it also is a type of a 
a stressor that is experienced and, ev and um, evidence suggests is really, really relevant to health outcomes, regardless of how it impacts material well-being, how much resources you have, such that we have these really shocking patterns where infant mortality among African-American women with more than a high school education in the US is higher than it is among white women with less than a high school education. So higher SES black women in this country showing negative outcomes that are mediated often by stress processes and intergenerational dif um, disadvantage, despite having achieved higher socioeconomic status. So it's, it's, there's, it definitely fits in in this uh, pathway that goes from an array of social factors that affect health that really don't have anything to do with the choices people make with respect to their health behaviors. But it's a stressor. I just want to say thank you, and you haven't heard the last, the last of us yet, because this is so important. This is so important, connected to the work that we're doing in so many areas. Um, and it just reminds me how important it is to do things that are cross-disciplinary, because you know you're thinking about frameworks that really impact on the way we um, are beginning to think about social determinants of health. And as Red said, you know, the way we teach about it and the things that we're going to talk about. And, um, and even as Bruce said, you know, the things that we talk to people about in the office and how we frame those kinds of discussions. So I want to thank you. This was everything we had hoped it would be. And um, appreciate your coming. Thanks a lot. Thank you so Could I make um, one peg? If you. We have a summer institute at um, Mailman, and some of this does focus on epi and social determinants. Um, so just to flag this um, website that you can go to, if you're interested in this summer institute, I was just thinking if your students, I mean, if your residents want um, more opportunities for supplementing their training, this is sort of an intensive, short thing. There are online formats, week-long courses on campus, and even Saturday work day workshops that may be relevant to your to your population. It's on all of this um, right now. That'll change in the future. All of this right now is only in June.